So as I was mentioning, you know, Mort and Ruben and their team have organized this extraordinary meeting. It's nice to see all of you here today. Um, I sort of feel like the thorn in the rose bush here between David and Adam, who are leading fields of immuno-oncology, and, and Joe Clinician here in the middle uh, gets to talk a little bit about CD38 and SLAM F7. But I've been specifically asked to answer the question, are they ready to go up front? And if you want to nap for the next 18 minutes, I am going to suggest to you that they're not quite ready, but will likely be ready in the future. And I'll explain a little bit why that is as we go through. So what do I want to achieve with you? I want to provide rationale for including monoclonal antibodies up front. Hopefully that shouldn't be a stretch based on the outstanding lecture that we just heard regarding immuno-oncology of how this is part of what, how we want to treat myeloma. But I think we also have to objectively assess how these contribute to both efficacy and toxicity of the regimens we use now. It's easy in myeloma, we've had such a revolution in myeloma in the last decade that it's just easy for us to say, oh, throw it in there. Uh, just like we did, frankly, with rituximab in the lymphoma days, we added it to CVP, we added it to CHOP, we added it to bendamustine. It didn't matter what we added it to, it just upgraded the response. And sometimes I think we have the same approach with daratumumab or elotuzumab or some of the other MABs that we have. And I think we just have to do so cautiously for reasons that I will outline to you. And then I'll hopefully predict a little bit of what will come in the future. Now, who am I to give a lecture on the immune system and cancer based on what we've heard from David and I know what we'll hear from Adam in a few minutes. But let me say that this is kind of the Joe simple version of thinking about the importance of immunotherapy in myeloma. And if you give me two minutes to describe this to you, I hope it will be slightly helpful to you. The way I like to think about it, uh, quite simply from this model, is are the three E's of immunotherapy, or at least of immunoediting, as we've heard described. Elimination, equilibrium, and escape. Elimination, what does that mean? So it means, of course, that your immune system, while you're sitting here listening to me, uh, and I'm not going to creep you out, but let's figure there's a thousand people in this room. A at least 20, 30, 40, possibly uh, close to uh, 50 of you, while we're sitting here, are starting to make a monoclonal protein. Now, I don't have a serum protein electrophoresis center set up at the back to check for Okay, that was a joke, right? Um, to se uh, set up at the back to check. But the reality is that some of you are doing that while we speak. But thankfully, your immune system is intervening and is, if you will, eliminating that trend towards monoclonality or trend towards malignancy. Like the very astute teacher who sees Billy looking out the window and not paying attention in class and says, Billy, you need to listen. If you don't listen to me, you're going to fail the test at the end of the year. And we have that ability to return back to a normal state. So we eliminate the trend towards malignancy. Unfortunately, that's not always effective. And so there are some who will uh, get, uh, overcome that mechanism that we have to elimination and come into equilibrium, where there will be some of you in this room who will make a monoclonal protein, but like we tell our patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, it's like a little bit of dust in the corner. It's there. If we didn't look for it, we wouldn't have noticed it, and it's not going to hurt you. And sometimes, believe it or not, we can demonstrate this in our lab and Leif Berksagel and the great work that they've done in the lab demonstrating that paradoxically, sometimes a small indolent clone will keep the body away from making more aggressive clones. I sometimes say it's good for all of us in life to have a little naughty, right? If you have that just a little naughty, not too much, just a little naughty, it, it keeps the big naughty away, right? And, and we all need that equilibrium in life. Um, and somehow that seems to happen in, in myeloma. And by the way, I would argue that this model is more relevant to myeloma than any other disease. Because I could argue on this basis that myeloma is the most common malignancy on the planet. Again, not to creep you out, but there are more people in this room creating a monoclonal protein than what Neil Kay is going to try and tell you about CLL and whatever diseases they treat. Let's just say MGUS was there before monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, whatever you call it. We were there first. But um, the reality is it's more common to do so. And then lastly, escape. And that's where it becomes important now. How is it that we break that equilibrium? How is it that that malignancy can overcome the immune system's ability to keep things in check in equilibrium? 
And so this is what drives David and Adam and so many of us that are trying to understand the immune system better to find ways to leverage to improve. Now I know this is, I probably insulted most immunologists in the crowd today by saying it so simply, but as a clinician's perspective, I think if we gain this, we come to appreciate it. Because we have come to appreciate that this is a very complicated, multi-clonal, very often disease, and understanding how the disease overcomes the immune mechanisms of vigilance to then become malignant will become very important. And so the drive for us to include things like monoclonal antibodies and the things that Adam is going to describe in a few moments is very important. So, the thinking is monoclonal antibodies, in particular daratumab right now that we're using so extensively, have demonstrated single agent activity. We haven't seen as much single agent activity with ELO, but of course we've seen it in combination as I'll show you. They've feasibly been added to both proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs. They, generally speaking, have limited and thankfully non-overlapping toxicity. I'm sure you've had this conversation with your patients when you've added a monoclonal antibody in the relapse setting, that thankfully the kinds of things we worry about in myeloma, like neuropathy and cytopenias and GI toxicities, are not the kinds of things we typically see with these monoclonal antibodies. And maybe we can enhance our induction regimens and get down to that MRD negativity that uh, Ola Langren was sharing with us earlier, the importance of getting this disease uh, in, in most respects down to MRD negativity. And because we don't have a 100% response rate, I mean, we're not upgraded to first class, right? Maybe our, our drugs have taken us from economy to business, but we can still get further upgrades and benefits in treating patients up front. So it makes sense, doesn't it, to just slather monoclonal antibodies on every upfront regimen. Well, before we do that, we have to recognize a few things. Well, first of all, as I've noted, our survival in myeloma, thankfully, is dramatically improving, and that's remarkable, and I'm very thankful for that. But if you look at this slide where there's the control cohort versus the myeloma cohort, there is still a considerable gap. So we still have work to do. Furthermore, if you note the improving survival, and this is from our Mayo database, and we're soon to add a next line to this, and it's amazing, we are seeing average survival of myeloma patients in the realm of a decade or more, especially in non-high-risk patients. I get worried about this bit. There are still people that succumb to this disease early on. So it is incumbent on us to try and be better at what we do up front in those patients. The concern, of course, is the law of diminishing returns. We already have response rates in the 90% range. How much more do we have to do to get someone to 95, 98, 100%? And toxicity, although toxicity is toxicity, it's always a concern. I would argue it's even more of a concern up front because this is not where at, at in late stage myeloma where we have to accept some toxicity on the basis of efficacy. As we treat patients, and I have a particular interest in treating very young patients with myeloma, 25 year old in my clinic last week, I want to be particularly careful with what I give him frontline therapy because some of the toxicities experienced could uh, affect him the rest of his life. And the cost issue has to be brought into, this is my good Canadian blood coming out, eh? Like we still think about cost. I mean, I'm in the US now, as maybe you know, I've been here for a decade and God bless America, I'm happy to be here. But you know, sometimes we can be a little bit callous to the cost of these things. And I know many of you are here today from Europe, from Latin America, from Canada, from other places where the cost issue is a greater issue. And so all we have to be careful if we're going to justify that amount of cost. And, and to be blunt, we haven't had very long-term use of these agents yet. Not that we expect some awful uh, long-term toxicities, but again, being Joe conservative, we have to be cautious and make sure we're doing the right thing. So right now, by the way, in a few minutes when I do the debate, I want you to forget what I'm saying right now, okay? Uh, you'll understand that later. But right now, in general, and this is our MSMART guidelines from Mayo, which you can look up at msmart.org, um, if you wish, that generally speaking, the combination of a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulatory drug are the standard of care upfront in transplant eligible and ineligible patients in general. Sometimes we'll use only one, but this is generally speaking. Uh, the standard. So what evidence do we have now? Well, thanks to Andre Jakubowiak and Jacob Laubach, they shared their slides with me that they presented at ASCO. Let me share some of their slides with you. So this was a study of combining DARA now with a regimen that is used fairly frequently in the United States, KRD, or uh, Carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, 
And their uh, background was, of course, that we know that KRD is a very effective regimen in general, understood, I won't go through every detail, and that daratumumab has so proven itself in the relapse setting, both in combination with a proteasome inhibitor or an immunomodulatory drug, as you know, and of course has received FDA approval, not only a single agent, but in combination with each of these agents based on Pollux and Castor. And so the concept was, let's add DARA to the regimen of KRD. Generally speaking, standard dosing, one thing they chose to do in cycle one was to split the dose of daratumumab because of the length of the infusion. We could talk about that at Q&A if you wish. And here is the patient disposition, granted very small numbers, and that's a very important point to remember. In both of these studies, we're obviously preliminary data looking at small numbers, but I have to say there is a little bit of a yellow flag that pops up here when I see that 36% discontinued treatment, even in small numbers. So again, I'm, I'm setting a higher standard of caution in the upfront setting, and so we see that. Thankfully, the toxicities were mostly the ones we would have typically seen with KRD, uh, which include the cytopenias, as you've seen. Uh, upper respiratory tract infections are always the number one cause of infection in myeloma studies. And thankfully, none of these were particularly worrisome, and it was consistent with what they had had before. Uh, there was um, a few cases of pulmonary embolism uh, that uh, bears a little bit of consideration, but thankfully not uh, considerable cardiac toxicity. But the response rate was, was good. It wasn't a major difference from what we had seen with KRD. If we focus on the four cycles in the first block here, that there was 100% response rate and 71% of patients achieved VGPR or greater. So they concluded that it was well tolerated, it was very effective, that there wasn't a problem with collecting stem cells. Um, We'll come back to the, the, uh, the DARA in a moment, but let's move right into ELO as well. So Jacob presented um, a very good study also, similar like design as I'll show you, of now adding elotuzumab to bortezomib lendex as opposed to carfilzomib lendex. And I commend them on an interesting design where everyone received ELO RVD, had their stem cells mobilized, and then there was a splay there afterwards based on transplant and maintenance therapy that today we don't have time to discuss. So again, not shocking, there was fatigue, there was neuropathy, uh, you know, there were infections in 50% of patients. However, here maybe not even a yellow flag, but a red flag of caution, that there were two patients who died, and we'll talk about this in a moment. There was a patient who experienced cardiac arrest and a patient who died from sepsis. So one patient died on study and one died within 30 days of, discon or, or, uh, 30 days of discontinuing uh, study, uh, study. And again, in a study that has such small numbers, I don't want to overstate the case. For those of you who are at the ASCO presentation, I thought that the discussant dealt with this particularly well, that we don't want to overreact, but whenever there's death involved, obviously we have to be particularly cautious. The response rates were reasonable at 82% after the four cycles. That could be upgraded, of course, by a transplant. So they concluded that it was uh, obviously an effective regimen, but in small numbers, it was a little bit concerning that there was a higher than uh, expected number of patients who discontinued therapy, and that infection in 50% uh, with a few serious infections raised some caution. So going back to my slide earlier of concerns, did we upgrade that law of diminishing returns? Can we scrutinize the toxicity? What about cost? And of course, it's too early to talk about long-term toxicity. So if we put in the first column, the study that I just showed you, in context with other ones, the response rate is relatively similar, although not as good as the phase three study, of course, in a greater number of patients. But I am concerned uh, about those infections and about those patients that died. Not enough, I would say, that the study, of course, had to be discontinued, but we need to understand it more. Similarly with KRD, quite impressive what looks like initial response rates, but when we compare them to other studies, that 71% VGPR or greater is good, but, um, and that's only after four cycles, we'll have to see with time, but we know in other studies, after a few more cycles, it was significantly higher. So it has perhaps given us an incremental rise, but maybe not a dramatic rise yet. Obviously, we need time to determine that. And much like the discussion with MRD this morning, I want to be cautious before you leave and say, oh, Mikhail told us we should add a monoclonal antibody up front. I don't think we're there yet. Do I think in time we will be? Quite likely, but I don't think we're there yet. 
And then, of course, there's the cost issue. And I thank uh, Peter Voorhees for this slide who shared it with me, uh, looking at it. And I know you can slice it different ways and in different places, and there's different costing ways. But these are ballpark numbers that if you think in 12 weeks of therapy for RVD, you're looking at around $60,000. You're, in many respects, uh, doubling that or coming close to doubling that by adding elotuzumab, um, and you're adding significantly more, obviously, with KRD Dara. So again, I'm not going to get into a cost war today, but I do want us to appreciate that uh, these costs are real, and um, ultimately, if it's the best thing for our patients, that's what we're going to do. But until we have that convincing evidence, I think it's critical to, in keep, to keep that in, in uh, perspective. So the numbers are small, but the increase in response rates may be not that much more impressive. A safety signal, it may be present, it may be just unfortunate that, that in that particular study there are those few patients that were very sick, and as we see it in much larger numbers, uh, the, number, the percentage will be smaller. So I would suggest, again, ignore this when I come for the debate later, but it suggests that RVD in many respects is the standard of care for most patients. And we have to be careful for, with, when, with regards to, of course, efficacy, toxicity, and cost as we monitor these in the frontline setting. Looking ahead to the future, when we have, and I've only listed a few of them here, when we look at some of the other critical pivotal studies, I think we'll have much greater information to inform this kind of talk at Lymphoma Myeloma 2018 and 2019 when we look at multiple combinations of adding, be it elotuzumab, daratumumab, and now even other monoclonal antibodies uh, to the standard of care in multiple venues as you've seen here, be it with RVD or be it with uh, other regimens in older patients. So as I've often said, I believe we have four major pillars of myeloma therapy right now. Proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and alkylators that we use, generally speaking, in combination together as a strategy in initial therapy because we know that uh, autologous stem cell transplant still plays a role in eligible patients. The fourth pillar is monoclonal antibodies. We're not, I don't think, quite at the stage where we can say we combine all four pillars together as we treat patients in one um, regimen or in, in one strategy, but I suspect that will happen before long because we're clearly using monoclonal antibodies in early relapse. I do think that there are supporting pillars on the outside, other drugs that clearly have a role and have a benefit, but tend to support the use of those pillars, as we've seen other drugs such as panabinostat and, and conventional chemotherapies like bendamustine. On the outside, we have distant pillars of venetoclax and selenexor that we have the privilege of using now in clinical trials and sometimes off-label that I think are going to move into that, uh, and it's not the perfect uh, uh, image, of course, of how we treat myeloma, but I think are going to be pillars that we're going to be see added to it. And because this is the immunotherapy session, of course, I have to add the fact that there are going to be a whole host of novel, if I can just call them immune drugs, whether they be bites or other um, uh, next generation monoclonal antibodies that will be added to this, and then of course the genuine excitement that is appropriate regarding CAR T-cell therapy that we're going to hear about in a moment. So it's led to a whole host of options that we have for our patients, and I suspect a growing number of options here. You can see at the bottom of the slide the plus, plus, plus. That's not just because I got an email from Paul Richardson about plus, 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 but um, that there are uh, multiple options that are coming in the future that I suspect are genuinely going to influence uh, what we do up front. But I would still suggest that right now in our upfront setting, we've not yet in day-to-day -day clinical practice added monoclonal antibodies, but we'll likely do so soon. I'd like to thank all of the Mayo Clinic uh, consultants and our whole teams that we uh, work with. Shaji Kumar out of Rochester is currently the head of our group. Uh, and as we uh, like to say, one Mayo, three doors. Uh, we work in uh, three different contexts. I have the privilege of being in Arizona. Uh, we've just re recently added a junior faculty, Jeremy Larson, and we're thankful to work together to try and find a cure for this horrible disease. Thank you so much for your attention.